Between 1968 and 1991, the ABC produced 370 episodes of A Big Country, with programs that travelled the length and breadth of Australia. This series revisits some of these stories. Meet Mike Hayes, writer, filmmaker, broadcaster and musician. You'll find him most Friday nights at the Willowarren pub near Kempsey in the mid-north of New South Wales. And meet Mike's ex, Janet Hayes. She's now mayor, no less, of the very same town of Kempsey. They've both come a very long way since they were filmed by a big country in 1981. Back then, Mike and Janet Hayes were together, not long married, and living the good life come on. in a run-down property in the village of Gundaroo near Canberra. In the years to come, many Australians would become very familiar with them and their growing family as the long-suffering yet cheerful residents of the Prickle Farm. <laughs> It fits us, it fits our lifestyle, it wouldn't fit everyone. I'd hate to be um, a sort of successful public servant looking for a, for a hobby, farm, uh, hobby farm existence in the great Australian wilderness but close to facilities and come out here. Because this isn't your A.V. Jennings home on a 40 acre block. There are very few uh, facilities, there's no blue water in the dunny. No water in the dunny. <laughs> They were curious times, the 70s and 80s, when it was the dream of many a young couple to throw it all in and go and live in the country. But that's just what Mike Hayes, recently divorced, and his new wife had done in 1979. They'd left a fairly normal life in Canberra for their half acre in Gundaroo. Their hobby farm was far enough from the city to feel like the country, yet close enough for Mike to continue his job as ABC Canberra's news editor. What's more, the trials and tribulations of living in their ramshackle property proved to be splendid material for a brand new radio series, which he called The Prickle Farm. Prickle Farm Stories number 23. When they originally bought The Prickle Farm, one of the big drawbacks was the bathroom. The ad which started the whole saga off described the stately halls of ablution as primitive, and primitive they indeed were. We moved there because we couldn't afford to move anywhere else. I think the house cost us $21,000 and we didn't have anything, but Michael's mother lent us some money. When their first son Tom was born, Janet decided to quit her job, also at the ABC, and become a full-time mum. Always a bit of an effort to have a bath, but uh, we share the bath water, like all good families should. And Tom usually has his first because he's the least dirty, although he does get a little grotty. But it's nice and uh, nice and warm in here today with the chip heater going madly in the corner. It's not so pleasant on very icy winter mornings with the ice which forms on the ceiling melting and dripping down on you in the bath and you're sitting here shivering anyway and the wind's whistling through the holes in the wall. Uh, it was different. Uh, I suppose all things... Uh, in time things change and um, and you start to you start to mind the the wind coming in and the cold very soggy night <laughs> Mike was never short of material for the radio series which proved very popular and was broadcast all over Australia soon he had regular prickle farmer columns in newspapers and magazines four books were published the family was always the star the children, they were to have four, were given their own special Prickle Farm names. And hey, what was your name? It always used to drive you crazy. Oh. They the little boy princess. Lizzie was dinosaur, yeah. Jack was definitely the last <laughs> telling mum. Janet herself became, somewhat perversely, the child bride. One of the first stories recalls the discovery of the Gundaroo house. There's really only one way to buy a place and that's on the spur of the moment. Especially if it's advertised not in the real estate section of the paper, but under pets and livestock. Gundaroo, the ad announced. Quaint 19th century cottage in township. Two bedrooms, kitchen and primitive bathroom. Mike hasn't been back here to see the old house since they left in 1986. 
At first I phoned the given number and carried on a conversation with a woman who seemed hardly heartbroken about flogging the ancestral home or whatever it was. How quaint is quaint, I asked. Oh, I didn't word the ad, she confessed. I would have merely described it as primitive. No, it doesn't look like a Canberra living room at all, does it? This is the Grand Lounge. It was just about exactly like this in, uh, in 1979. Although the chandelier, put the chandelier in myself. A touch of civilization. But this is the 1874 interior. Probably still leaks wind in through the cracks between the boards too. This was about as far as the house went. This was the back door and there was a, a bit of a skilly in there with a, a tiny kitchen and then a, our legendary bathroom. But the, the, there were these pokey dark little rooms that uh, apparently the original owner, a fellow called Robert Edwards, the blacksmith who built this place, brought up a million kids all in, the, in these tiny rooms. It was quite amazing. This was the first attempt at civilization. We pulled the, the old kitchen and bathroom out and extended out here and doubled the size of the place. And the bath. This, this, this was the master touch, a real bathroom. No chip heaters, real hot water. That was the first, uh, first real sign that we were becoming sophisticated, maybe joining the human race. Now this is all new. But the re really interesting thing about this is that I thought we might come in here and feel a bit nostalgic and I don't because it's pretty much doing the same sort of thing obviously for uh, for the people who live here now they're getting the same sort of magic out of the place because if I was still here this is probably the way it'd look no it's still the old the grand old house of Gundaroo oh, it was a great adventure very cold and just meeting new people and we were you know, really happy, and um, we had Tom, and uh, he was a beautiful baby, and he's now a beautiful 22-year-old. Uh, and it was was exciting. It was was a real adventure. The ducks. The ducks are very political animals. We found out when we got them. Morning, all. We were, first of all we got the darker ones, the khaki Campbells, and they sat around discussing politics and moving motions and making agendas and manifestos for the takeover of the barnyard. We got the other ducks, the white one, sort of counterbalance them. They're good country party ducks, always go to church, staunchly Christian, and are extremely well behaved. Uh, no boys in the pond. <laughs> no, you're not a lack duck. We used to have a lot of fun. I think one of the uh, things about Michael is that he can see humour in in things that no other human being on earth can see. It's a lovely balmy morning here at the William Affleck Memorial International Sports Complex at Gundaroo. Tempers are expected to flare as the wine bar wanderers clash in the grand final against the Muscatel Marauders. Tension's high and so are most of the spectators. And straight to the action as the Maulers take control of the ball and head brilliantly down the field. My God, look at that. Poetry in motion. If only Henry Lawson could see me now. <laughs> We're in Gundaroo for about seven years. In that time, it was very much uh, a traditional Victorian country village, which is different from, from living out on a, on a farm, but uh, very, very real. And then gradually, the change became apparent. It was, uh, it was always doomed to become a dormitory suburb of Canberra. We saw the, the winds of change coming. In 1986, the Hayes family moved to Lagan, high in New South Wales' southern highlands. The house, to be christened Prickle Farm No. 2, was a rambling convict-built affair and desperately needed repairing. We came out and looked at this place, and from the front it just looked horrible. Came round the back, came round this way, and there was this grand building needing a lot of care and attention. There, there, was, there was no guttering. The only water came from uh, dams up the back. None of this decking was here. That had, that had all rotted and fallen away. And it was, it was quite a mess, but it just, it just had this, this grandeur. It leaked and it still had holes in the walls. And of course, with this grand house, there came land, 12 acres. So the Prickle Farm became 
well, 24 times bigger than it used to be, and that enabled us to start getting into things other than gardening. <laughs> I was milking goats, I got into to berry farming, but most importantly I think got into to being part of a, a real country community, and as a writer that broadened my focus. I wasn't just writing cutesy pie stories about hobby farm things, and I was really starting to tell the story of real Australian country people. While Mike was happily absorbed in all the new directions offered up by the latest Prickle Farm, Janet found that she too needed a fresh focus in her own life. I had uh, the four children at that stage, and uh, had it, so it had been almost ten years of nappies and formulas and everything that goes with that. And I really thought that my brain had gone into recess, and I decided that I needed to somehow reactivate it. I wasn't actually thinking politics at the time, but I was having a shower one morning and the local news broadcaster said that the local shire had extended uh, the time for nominations for a by-election. One of the councillors had resigned mid-term and nobody had nominated. So I thought, you beaut, terrific, that's easy, I'll, I'll just go and put, uh, put my name down and, and rock up to the next council meeting. Uh, but somebody else must have been showering at the same time and heard the same news broadcast and two blokes went and nominated against me, <laughs> and, which peeved me no end. And so I had to fight a, a by-election, uh, but I was successful. Yeah, she stood for the, for the, uh, in a by-election for the, the, the Crookle Shire Council and, uh, and, that, uh, and, and that took on and got a real taste for politics. Uh, which uh, was never my cup of tea, but uh, she seemed to thrive on that, yeah. Eventually, the never-ending repairs and the long winters in Lagan began to get them down. They took a holiday on New South Wales' north coast and started thinking about moving. This was the first place up here we actually had a look at. It was lovely and warm and bright and went back to Lagan where we used to live and that went to bed and next morning at Lagan, two feet of snow on the ground. So if this had been an abandoned beer carton or something, I think I would have bought it just for the warm. So the Hazers moved into Prickle Farm number three. Janet was soon on the local council, while Mike was expanding into video and multimedia, but always with a humorous country theme, a legacy of the Prickle Farm days. It seems the, the Prickle Farm days uh, were like days out of a comic strip, uh, from one point of view. But they were they were real character building days, and uh, although I might occasionally forget how important they were to me, it's amazing the number of people who who heard the stories on radio and read them in newspapers and magazines. But they meant a heck of a lot too. You know who's responsible for this? A lot of it was fairly tied up with having children, because uh, despite being called the child bride in the series. I was in fact 31 when Tom was born, <laughs> and so I, was, I might have been childlike and childish, but certainly wasn't a child. Uh, it was uh, a wonderful time. We have four of the, undoubtedly, the most beautiful children in the world. Tom was Tom. first, big Tom. Tom, then me, then Amy, then, then Elizabeth, Lizzie, Elizabeth, and then Jack. These two silly looking things here. Don't hit me. Don't smack your mother. <laughs> Didn't Tom rip the head off a sheep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Yeah. He piddled in the fire bucket down at the hall. <laughs> it was full of sand. He piddled in We've the fire. We've got a photo to prove it. Like many families, when they look back over the years, the Hazers maybe remember those times of poverty and struggle as some of the best. But the hardships that make life rich can also be the pressures that tear relationships apart. No life is idyllic. See, that, that the whole Gundaroo thing and the Prickle Farm thing, people expected it to be like something out of the good life on television. Of course, it, uh, there, there, there are always there, there are difficulties and there, there are uh, hardships and what have you in any form of life, no matter how, not, how, how you string them together in a, in a, in a story. So I guess that, uh, that, that uh, has a toll on everyone. When we got married out here, one of the things we put in our, our wedding ceremony is that we keep each other laughing. And that, that's what Gundaroo is. A mob of people who just laugh at each other, laugh things off. I don't know, I guess we stop laughing. You move on to the next phase of your life. It's not good enough to go into decline and to, and to just be satisfied with your lot and think, well, the kids are, are growing up now, what do I do? Do I just sit back? 
or do I now start an, yet another adventure? Janet left Mike in the Prickle Farm in the year 2000. 18 months later, she was elected Mayor of Kempsey Shire. Uh, that's been moved, seconded. Any discussion? This is the one that, that's worn more off, most often. They went over to red some years ago. And, and every shire has a different, uh, a different type of robe. It's rather beautifully made. And this is the, these are the chains, chains of office. Well, this is my house. Uh, it was the original Alder Villa School, which was built in 1875. And I've been here about two and a half years now and working very hard to restore it. <laughs> it's very different from the Prickle Farm, I can assure you. It doesn't leak. <laughs> I've put verandas on it around three or two sides. Um, and I've, the children have a bedroom each. It's just nice to live in a house that's safe and warm and secure, you know, all those things that we need in life, like security and warmth and shelter. Jack, come in and put your powder. I guess we talked about it. Over the years, you see friends split up, and you see all that acrimony and and uh, using the children. And we always said over the years that if ever we split up, never thinking you were, because you never think you're going to, uh, that we would never ever succumb to that kind of uh, uncivilised behaviour and, and haven't. Good, sweetheart, how's it going? In terms of the kids, it's been very amicable and Michael and I are still friends, we still talk. Um, but, and the kids are great, they, they're here through the week and they go to Deep Creek on the weekends and I'm very, very insistent, and as is he, I think, to, to maintain a really good relationship with him and then with me as well. That's really terrific. Are you yeah. happy? Yeah. You think you'll pass? Yeah. <laughs> no, all women out of the kitchen. No, women can't cook curry. I'll be sorry for that later. It's interesting, when, when all that occurred, uh, there was a, a feeling for a while of you know, ha has the last uh, few years and everything I've been writing about uh, been a lie? And uh, then I thought, hey, hey, hang on, you're still here, the kids are here, this great old house is here, the bush is still around you, the animals are here, the, the, your friends and your music still there, and uh, and then someone came along that uh, was more than prepared to share all of that. So it's been a, a whole new life and a, a very happy one. Very nice. You missed a bit? I missed lots of bits. Mike and his new partner Chris have been together for two years now. She's brought her own two teenagers into the household. Between us we've got nine children, seven of which are mine. Um, it would be really nice if life could be like the Brady Bunch. And uh, the best you could say about, uh, about the situation of living in the bush with four teenagers, two of whom are doing, uh, doing year 12, it's like the Brady Bunch with really bad language. Remember the Foggy Mountain breakdown and it's of the G. E minor. Oh yeah. It's always been more of the same, writing a bit, making the odd video, playing a bit of music. Through the Prickle Farm stories, Mike's fame has spread to country people everywhere. He's developed a reputation for listening to what they have to say. Now he finds them coming to him whenever they need a spokesman for country issues. Lately, he's been donating his time to local conservation groups. In the name of flood mitigation, but really to free up more land for the grazing, the government uh, stuck these floodgates on uh, an entrance to what was uh, a really bountiful tidal wetland. My job has been to open one floodgate for the last year and just see what had happened. Almost instantly, 
the whole wetlands in there started to change. First of all, the fish came back. Then the, the predators came back, the, 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 the water birds, the Brahmini kites and the shags and what have you. And the mangroves started to sprout. It's been a, an interesting task juggling everyone's interests. We're concerned. Water quality is an oyster farmer's main priority. It just shows you that uh, when the salt comes in, this will be uh, underwater here. It's not very salty at all. Well, Lindsay Brackenbury he was uh, the man who's probably t taught me more about this whole system than anyone else. Ah, a lot of birds out there. Pity the sun's in our eyes. Are they a couple of jabberies there? It looks like there's not many of them around these days, is there? No. I got involved in it, I guess, because it was something I, I knew very little about. And it was, it was an opportunity to, to find out something that was happening in the new community. And uh, it, it's, it's just a magic place. Mike would love to turn some of these experiences into new Prickle Farm stories. But even though he's in demand as a writer, he's about to publish his 18th book, they're rarely about country issues anymore. The papers just suddenly decided, almost en masse, in about 1997-98, that they just weren't going to give the coverage they'd given to, uh, to everyday regional affairs uh, that they had in the past, and the act just fell. It's been so frustrating over the last four years, for instance, since I've written a regular uh, Prickle Farm type thing, there's been the Pauline Hanson, the One Nation phenomenon. There's been droughts, there's been floods, there's been fires. And I've been there, I've been doing all this stuff, I've been living amongst it, and I haven't been able to, to write it, and that's been the ultimate frustration. Midnight in a liquor store in Kempsey Behind the neon clothes that just begun Boy comes through the door, points a pistol. He can't find a job, but God has found a gun. It's sad to say that the, the media in general has lost interest in covering the details of rural life. There's a, there, there's a, a mistaken belief that country people are all farmers, and certainly they're only a small percentage of what, what we are in the country. And uh, country, farmers' issues tend to be covered to a lesser and greater extent all the time. But country people are more than just farmers. They're uh, out, out here in, the, in this area. Country people are long-term unemployed. Some have been unemployed for 30 years and never wanted to be. Country people are drug addicts in some cases. Country people are people with mental health problems who live out here on the blocks to get away from their demons. Country people are kids who, to all intents and purposes, have got no future. There are no jobs for them. Country people are battlers in towns. They're people who live in the country simply because they can't afford to live anywhere else. And they're never taken into consideration when, when government makes decisions. There's this real need for someone to keep writing, broadcasting, drawing or doing something from within the country community to get their message across because we're just being ignored. I just love the idea of living in small communities and writing about the dynamics, the, the blues, the disagreements, but the, the wonderful agreements, the wonderful common bonds that people have, the helping each other out, the laughing at the sm slightest thing down the wine bar. They were, they were just so magic. And it was really good as a writer to be able to share those with other people and know that they knew what we were talking about. I did feel slightly trapped by the Prickle Farm thing. It was so huge, it was so immense that it was like being uh, uh, part of a dynasty, if you like, that you didn't dare shatter anybody's dreams because people looked at our on our family as a kind of role model, if you like. And, um, and so many people, and still, to this day, so many people saw us as the kind of, um, the perfect family who went onto the land. And, and I, there were times when I did feel a little uh, overwhelmed by it all. And 
I want it to be me. It's been a great life and the, the message I, I, I get out of all of this and all the experiences is a, is a great Lyle Lovett song. The uh, chorus goes, if the stars didn't shine on the water and the sun didn't burn on the sand, if I were the man that you wanted, I wouldn't be the man that I am. And that's life.